Throughout history, there have been people who have committed some of the most heinous crimes fathomable. For those crimes, they have been convicted and sentenced to death. Welcome to Death Row Executions, where we take a look into the lives of society's worst offenders. And now, your host, Air. Elizabeth Atherton Potts was born on December 21, 1846 in Manchester, England. Not much is known about her early life, but by the time she turned 21 years old, she married a man by the name of Josiah Potts. They married in England, but in 1865, just two years after they wed, they immigrated to the United States and stationed in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Elizabeth and Josiah had seven children together, but for unknown reasons, they were only taking care of two children a son by the name of Charlie, who was born in 1873, and a girl by the name of Edith, who was born in 1883. Financially, the family struggled, but things turned around after Josiah found a new job working for the Central Pacific Railroad. He was initially working in Utah, but was transferred to Carlin, Nevada. After the Potts family moved to Carlin in 1886, Elizabeth and Josiah went through a rough patch so Elizabeth moved out of the family home and traveled to Fresno, California all alone. With no kids to take care of and no longer speaking to her husband, she entered into a new relationship with a man by the name of Miles Fawcett. Miles was a fellow Englishman who came from the same area as Elizabeth and the two hit it off. They eventually married, even though Elizabeth had not formally filed for divorce from her husband Josiah. Some speculate that Elizabeth went back to Carlin for financial gain, but in 1887, a year after she moved to Fresno, she and Miles traveled back to Carlin together. Elizabeth reconciled with her husband Josiah, and a short while after her move back into her old home, Miles came and the Potts's agreed to have him live with their family as a boarder. Elizabeth and Miles kept their relationship a secret, and Josiah had no idea his wife even knew Miles let alone married him. Before the end of the year, Miles was able to save up enough money to move out, and he ended up buying a ranch near the Potts's. Although away from his secret wife, he continued to visit her home and give her money on a weekly basis because she agreed to continue cooking for him and doing his laundry. It was New Year's Eve, 1887. Elizabeth and Josiah invited Miles over to hang out and celebrate the night. Miles came with his friend, J.P. Linebarger, and J.P. later went on record and said the only reason why Miles said he was attending the party was because he was going to collect a debt. And even though he said that he was coming to collect money, he came with a bag that contained $120 worth of gold pieces. Elizabeth asked Miles to spend the night, but being that it was getting too late and it was now the next morning on January 1st, 1888, JP decided to leave without Miles. JP and Miles came to the gathering in a wagon that belonged to Miles, but when JP left, he got home a different way because the wagon was left behind. Days turned into weeks and no one had heard from Miles. JP noticed that his wagon was still on the Potts' property, and when he questioned Josiah, he let him know that Miles sold him his wagon, his ranch, and his horses. For proof, Josiah showed him a bill of sale. Other people questioned the Potts's as well, and they came up with another story saying they all got into an argument on New Year's Day, causing Miles to leave. JP did not believe that Miles would just up and leave, so he reached out to local police to see if they would be able to follow up as a possible missing persons case. By this time, it was summer of 1888, and with so many people questioning the whereabouts of Miles, Elizabeth and Josiah grew weary, so they packed their belongings and valuables and moved from Carlin to Rock Springs, Wyoming. They agreed to rent their house to the Brewer family, but before they officially moved in, Deputy McIntosh, who was following up on JP's request, made it to the Potts family home and immediately noticed that the front door was wide open. The family most likely left in a rush, and once inside, Deputy McIntosh discovered that majority of the household items were gone and or out of place, and although he noticed so many things out of the ordinary, he still concluded that there was no foul play 
and closed the investigation on finding Miles. George and Amelia Brewer moved into the Potts family home shortly after the investigation ended. They were comfortable at first, but they started feeling as if the house was haunted by a ghost. Amelia worked for the Elko Press, used the pseudonym of Busy Bee, and wrote an article in January of 1889 that read, It is a little exciting when one has the good luck to move into a haunted house. So far, the ghost hasn't scared any of us, but he is here just the same. Sometimes he taps on the headboard of the bed, other times he stalks across the kitchen floor, and he hammers away at the door and nobody's there. But the gayest of capers of all is cut up in the cellar. There, he holds high revels and upsets the pickles and carries on generally. Weeks after the article came out, George decided to examine the cellar in detail because that is where the ghost caused most of the ruckus. Equipped with a long iron rod, George made his way under the house, into the cellar, and began poking around with his rod. He stumbled upon a soft spot in the ground, and he assumed it was soft because it had previously been dug up, so he started to dig in that same spot. He wasn't thorough because he was only taking out bits of dirt with his rod, so he decided to call it quits and left the cellar. For weeks, he would think about that same spot in the cellar, and he finally decided to go under the house again, and when he saw the spot he was messing around with weeks before, he saw something that he described as an old turnip. He pulled whatever it was and found out that it was not an old turnip, but a clump of hair, and he immediately grew sick from the smell. George quickly got in touch with Deputy McIntosh, who in turn got in touch with Sheriff Lou Bernard. They arrived at the house with a team of officers and started to dig. As they were digging, they kept uncovering multiple body parts, so they knew they were dealing with a person who was dismembered. When they found the head, they noticed that it was burned and the skull was crushed. They were unable to identify who the body belonged to, but upon further digging, they found a knife that was inside one of the pants pockets and knew it belonged to Miles Fawcett. Sheriff Bernard then took a trip to Rock Springs, Wyoming and surprised the Potts at their new home. Sheriff Bernard said they had to return to Carlin with him and on the car ride back, Josiah was not able to stay quiet like Elizabeth. He started confessing and admitted to Sheriff Bernard that he was the one who dismembered Miles Fawcett. He did not admit to killing him though and said that Miles died from a self-inflicted gunshot wound. They were officially arrested on February 16, 1889 and pled not guilty to murder. The prosecutor working on the case was District Attorney W.C. Love and representing Elizabeth and her husband was J.A. Plummer. The judge presiding over the case was Judge R.R. R. Bigelow and the trial began in March of 1889. J.P. testified in court and said that Elizabeth and Josiah owed Miles money and he let J.P. know that he had enough dirt on Elizabeth to make them pay. Charlie testified in court and said he was not advised by his parents on what to say, but he did witness what happened that night Miles died. He said that he heard arguing, and once he opened the kitchen door, he noticed Miles was the one holding the gun and not his parents. He heard a gunshot, but chose to go back to bed and not question his parents the following day. Elizabeth testified after Charlie, and she went on the stand and said that Miles came over to pick up his clean laundry, and after JP left, they continued to drink. Miles was not in her presence for a while, and when she went to look for him, he was with Edith. She said she called him an old rich and threatened to have him tarred and feathered. She said that Miles got angry with her, told her to keep quiet, and during that time, Josiah had left the house, and when he returned, she did not tell him what had happened. She then said she wrote a letter to Deputy McIntosh detailing what Miles had done or was about to do with Edith, but Miles found the letter and shouted, to hell with your note. He then died from a gunshot wound and before pulling the trigger said, you folks will be blamed for this. Shortly after that incident, Josiah returned home and told Elizabeth to go to bed so he could take care of everything. She also asserted that they did not owe Miles any money and on the other hand, he actually owed them $200 for room and board debt. After Elizabeth testified, Josiah took to the stand. 
He said that he sat next to the body of Miles for a majority of the night, thinking about what to do. He did not think anyone would believe what really happened, so he decided he was going to try and hide the body. He wrapped Miles up in blankets and dug up a grave in the cellar and buried him there. Three months after he buried Miles, he started to panic and thought someone would find his body, so he dug up the shallow grave and, in his own words, I cut up the body in pieces. I cut off the head and feet. I mashed the head with an axe in order to burn it. I chopped up the feet a little with an axe. I succeeded in burning a little of the skull and a little of his foot. I had to give it up and could not finish on account of the smell. The trial lasted just four days and after four hours of deliberation, the jury found Elizabeth and Josiah guilty of first degree murder. On March 22nd, the couple received their sentence when Judge Bigelow sentenced them to death and in his own words, to be hanged by the neck until dead. The initial execution date was set for May 17, 1889, but after an appeal, the couple was granted a stay of execution. The main person rallying for Josiah in particular to be granted a pardon was the judge who actually sentenced them to death, Judge Bigelow. He wrote that many people in the community considered Josiah to be a very kind and respectable man who never got into any trouble. On the contrary, he asserted that Elizabeth was a masculine 200 plus pound woman with a domineering personality and she ordered her shy and quiet husband around. He also went on record to say that although Edith did not testify in court, she did tell multiple people that her mom killed Miles Fawcett and her father Josiah was not there when the murder happened. The Supreme Court denied the appeal, and after another appeal, the Board of Pardons then denied granting either of them a pardon. Even though Elizabeth was guilty, at the time, no woman had been hanged in the state of Nevada before, so many people protested, saying a woman should not be hanged. Over 250 people in the community signed petitions to halt the execution of Elizabeth, but nothing worked. The final appeal was denied in November of 1889, and the execution was rescheduled for June 20th, 1890. Nevada did not have any gallows in place for the executions, so they had to order one from California. It was actually a double gallows, so the couple could be executed together. After it was delivered to Elko, Nevada, it was rebuilt in between a jail yard and a courthouse. After being built, they tested it by using bags of sand, and they concluded that they worked perfectly. The sound of the gallows being built was loud enough for inmates to hear, and it was reported that both Elizabeth and Josiah grew more and more anxious in their cells. Invitations were sent out to specific people to witness the execution, and there were 52 men in total who showed up the day of the execution. It was 10.30 in the morning, and it was time for Elizabeth and Josiah to be executed. They were given time to pray with a pastor, and were then read their death warrants. Elizabeth said, Innocent, so help me God. We are innocent, that's all we can say. We are innocent from first to last. Elizabeth changed into a white dress, and she tied black bows over her neck and wrists. Josiah changed into a suit, and before being taken to the gallows, they were offered some alcohol, and they both drank a small bottle. When they reached the top of the gallows, they were instructed to remove their shoes, their legs were then tied together, and they were allowed to have one final kiss. A black hood was then placed over their heads, and before the trap door was opened at around 10.45 a.m., Josiah was heard saying, Lord, have mercy on me. And Elizabeth was heard saying, Lord have mercy on my soul. Josiah, who was of average weight and height, was pronounced dead at around 11.10 a.m. And witnesses said that his body spun around three times after he was hanged. As for Elizabeth, her weight was not taken into consideration and the drop caused her head to nearly detach from her body. She died instantly and their bodies were then placed in caskets that were next to each other. Elizabeth became the first woman to be executed in the state of Nevada, and to date has been the only woman executed in that state as well. As for her bigamous relationship with Miles, 
Many speculate that Josiah never found out about their secret relationship and it was not made public before or during trial. It only became public knowledge after their execution when proof of the marriage between Miles and Elizabeth were made public. Do you feel that they were guilty even though majority of the evidence was circumstantial and no one's story was the same? I do feel that they were guilty, but I also think that no one will ever truly know what happened that night.